a heads up. We are looking for volunteers to help organize seminar for next semester. If you guys are interested, um, talk to Professor Jamal, get your name on the list. I do have to tell you guys from personal experience, it is an awesome opportunity to be able to network with um, the industry and bring in different folks. And it really kind of opens different doors for you guys. So I want to encourage you guys to think about volunteering to set these up. This week, oh, uh, next week, we're just doing a barbecue out on the patio at Brown. So everybody can come. We'll have a big celebration to kick off the end of the year. So congratulations, guys. Another semester, well done. Yay! <laughs> All right, so this week we are very honored to have Dave Hammond come in. He's a critical minerals um, and mineral economist specialist. He's an expert in the field with over 30 years mining experience. Um, we're very honored to have him here. And I'm going to it over to you, Dave. Thanks. Is this on? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you, everybody, uh, for inviting me out to talk today. Um, happy to be here. Um, uh, you may have noticed I am an alumni of the uh, School of Mines. I got my PhD in mineral economics over there. Um, this is going to be kind of a choppy talk because I had to make some big revisions um, on it just in the last few days. Uh, because some of the stuff that um, Jamie Bernard talked about last week on the USGS and the critical minerals definition process and everything, kind of stole a bunch of stuff what I am. <laughs> uh, and that's all right, because Jamie gave an awesome presentation. Believe me, I learned a lot from seeing that, uh, a lot of details I was not aware of. Uh, so I really compliment him. I thought he was just a superb um, uh, talk, a, a extremely informative. So I can think about that I can kind of take some of the stuff that I have already in the can and do some modifications. And I decided it's unwinding down things. I see uh, that um, maybe I just got to have a rant. So <laughs> I decided the rant would be good. And here's the rant. Are you keeping up with all the things that are going on in um, the, min, the critical mineral space. I'm not. I'm overwhelmed. I can't believe the amount of crap that comes in every day, most of which I'm starting to get pretty skeptical about and having trouble believing. So uh, what do I need to do? Just get enter on this? Or, or an arrow? The arrow. Ah, I see it. Better. So why can't I keep up? What are the things that are just... Uh, Overwhelming me. Well, constant change in incoherent government policies regarding climate change and critical minerals. Every week, sometimes every day, there's a new policy statement or a definition or something that comes out that's affecting the demands of critical uh, minerals. Um, last few days, uh, Biden, no, last week, Biden administration, hey, we're going to go to 67% EVs by. 2035 or what? Uh, 2032, and that's how many years? Mm, yeah, uh, rapidly evolving technology developments, every one of which is going to be a game changer. Going to change critical minerals. It's going to change how the rare, rare earths are processed, where they're coming from, and how they're going to be used in consumer products, uh, primarily uh, motors. Uh, Example, um, hey, wasn't it just a few weeks ago that Tulsa said one of our next generations of EVs, we're going to get rid of the rare earth motors on it? Ooh, that could be interesting. Um, so, uh, puzzling procurement investment strategies of the critical minerals end users. What am I talking about there? Well, Tesla getting in the nickel business, getting in the rare earth business, GM, trying to get into the uh, uh, lithium business out at Thacker uh, Pat, uh, Pat. Hmm. What do you think GM really knows about mining? <laughs> eh, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that. The cascade of press release regarding new mineral discoveries. 
Every day, uh, every week goes by, we've got a new junior. Man, we have signed up on Wyoming. Enough rare earths. Uh, it literally covers hundreds of square miles. Well, the grade, well, we won't really talk about that. You know? <laughs> or process, well, we're still working on it. But this comes up all the time. Um, pronouncements by uninformed media by green injury associated mineral requirements. Has anybody kind of looked at these things and seen? Yeah. Um, the conflicting agendas of the environmental activists and the NGOs. We've got a lot of green organization activists that are got a whole staff, a whole side of their office that's promoting, that's encouraging policy uh, and actions so that we can advance the climate agenda and we can solve all these problems. Well, across the hall is another group. What's this group? This group is trying to abolish all mining, certainly in the United States. To me, I, I can't deal with I don't know about them, but I can't deal with the dissonance uh, here. Okay, and uh, perhaps I'm just getting too old for this. <laughs> I'm not the only one, though. Let me read a little quote from Jack Lifton, my journal, two days ago. Maybe you saw it. Every time a new person's lab experiment produces a press release on an innovative, disruptive technology advance. In battery technology, electric power distribution, for example, experimental results, hugely unconfirmed by third party reproduction, are counted by Wall Street analysts as breakthroughs. And Wall Street uses this ignorant nonsense to pump some junior mining or processing price south south price. Okay? Like I said, maybe some other people are from saying. So, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to try to get through. In a very hurried way, I always bring twice as many slides as I can actually get through. Uh, we're going to talk about climate change critical minerals. I am going to talk about the USGS critical minerals list. I have a critique, but maybe not so much a critique, just some observations on it. Then I want to spend some time talking about copper. As you know, copper is not on the 2022 critical minerals list. However, there's quite a bit of action in the mining community now, the level of uh, National Mining Association and uh, SMB, and I'm actually involved in trying to help them with some of the information. We got to get copper on the critical minutes list because, yeah, it's critical regardless of what's going to be happening in the future. Uh, then a few comments on the critical mineral uh, and then. I will mention a few things Sarah asked me to talk about, and that is what are the implications about all this critical mineral business on students, on the on the on the people in the mining community that are just coming into the uh, industry. I'll make some comments on that. They may be helpful, well, or they may not be helpful. But <laughs> that's what it's worth. All right, climate change. Okay, here are all the things that are coming from. This is just the last three years. Of the These are goals. Well, I'm sorry, some next ones the last few years. Really, goals of uh, politicians, climate change activists, you know, the whole world, uh, the UN, about where we might hold the temperature increase to 1.5 over pre industrial levels, the 67% of US, you can just go down the road. Um, of, of what what the players are demanding, the the the, the green community, the climate activists players are demanding. Now, I want to point out just a couple of things: the multitude of state and local regulatory climate actions. These are some of the things that are really driving even more so than is this is power generation down here. Uh, yes, California also has its own um, requirements for uh, non-internal combustion engines within the, the next few years. But this is kind of the big scale, but these are things that are really uh, driving what's evolving on the power generation um, uh, side. And most jurisdictions in the U.S., most states, and even some as uh, of our quasi-wacky 
municipal jurisdiction Boulder uh, that uh, would do you know have have their own uh, standards. These are the things that are driving it over the last three years, or since 2000, about 2020. These are the acts. These are the executive orders that are, are driving those standards or those goals that we saw in the previous slide. There are two on here that, to me, are really uh, the big ones. This one right here, Repower EU. This is what's driving the climate change emission standards and everything in the European Union. And of course, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was basically how we're going to carpet bomb the climate, climate change and uh, all the associated part, uh, pieces of it with money over the next uh, few years. What I've noticed, what you may have noticed is they don't have a bombardier on these planes that are going to be doing the carpet bomb. So a little bit worried about how much of my money, your money is going to be wasted uh, through this whole thing. Will it accomplish anything? And then now at the bottom, we have the other side of it. We need to do, uh, we have all these things that are directing solution to the problem. We'll see on the consumption side, but we have down here that are opposite things on the supply side. We won't beat that too much in the interest of time. Now, let's see if this is what I want. Um, I don't know, I'm assuming most of you are kind of familiar with this, but the, the magnitude of the fossil fuel problem, the emissions from fossil fuel, and what renewables can do for it. It's coded as what we need to do, convert to uh, renewables, get rid of all the fossil fuels. Well, this is a little indication, just an indication of the size of the problem. This is 2021, and you can see down here, oil, uh, natural gas, coal, nuclear energy, and then renewables at the top. Well, we basically got to get that bright brown thing to come down to at least half, right? This is a this is a, a mind-boggling problem to make that much progress in about ten years, or or less than ten years by two thousand, about two thousand thirty or two thousand fifty. Um, it's it's monumental. Um, And another illustration, um, I just pulled these out of the latest BP statistical summary. Um, and I saw it said, you know, this is quite interesting. Million metric tons of coal burned globally. When I was in the coal business, I kind of got out of it. Uh, around uh, 2000 and uh, two, uh, around the year 2000, right here. How much coal was consumed globally? Well, about four and a half billion tons. Of that, the US was probably around 900 at that time. The highest knot the US ever got was 1.2 uh, uh, billion uh, tons. So, hey, I'm done with the coal business here, or I'm, I'm kind of fading out of it. My God, 2021 in here, 8 billion tons. I, I had kept up. I had that struck me. My God, we've actually gone up more and more. We're not making progress on reducing the coal the emissions from coal. And where is it going? Coming from all this new consumption, China and uh, China and India, which, as you know, are now each countries of about 1.5 billion people, and China in particular is building coal plants about as fast as they can design and set them up. And I don't see that changing. 
I don't see them say, oh, we're starting to start back off coal um, for decades. Why? Well, one, they don't from a political standpoint, uh, geopolitical standpoint, they don't have the intention of slowing down their economy. They want to keep it moving forward. And secondly, they really can't. There's just no way that they can offset the electricity, the electrical generation with non-fossil fuel uh, uh, resources or sources. So uh, that kind of did shock me. I said, I, I didn't realize that was 20 but some years ago. We were there, and it's only gotten the consumption has only gotten higher and higher, even though the US has uh, reduced a great amount. Okay, now looking at the um, the types of technology to solve the problem. How many, I'm assuming some of you have seen this, right? Do you really understand it? Okay, there are two things on here. One is minerals used in transportation, minerals used in power generation. The standard up there is kilograms per vehicle. The colors represent different uh, elements, minerals over here. And we have a conventional internal combustion car and electric car that are BEV. You can see that it takes a lot more minerals, a lot more minerals uh, to um, function or in the production of battery electric vehicles. Down here, power generation, the measurement is kilograms of materials required for one megawatt of electrical generating capacity. So um, uh, we have offshore wind, onshore wind, solar, nuclear, coal, natural gas. And this is really a function of energy density. So wind and solar are really weak, have low energy density, as a composed of a certain, um, nuclear uh, or coal, which has a much higher energy content uh, uh, per unit. So you can see that the offshore wind, onshore wind, uh, sort of all, all takes take a lot more material to for for creating each megawatt of electrical uh, 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 generation. The one on the winds is even worse. Because if we were to convert, these are based on main plant capacities. So if we were to say, we're going all in in the United States. To accomplish that and basically say, we're getting rid of backup generation. However, we can do that because we have wind in Texas, we have wind in Montana. And if that's not blowing down there, it'll be blowing up here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the capacity factors on windmills is what? 40% at best? Now, let's say a third. So if you're going to have this all balanced out and enough capacity to transfer around where the wind's not blowing or some other issues, you'd have to build three times the site, wouldn't you? What would that do per available megawatt of power that would make those numbers even? even larger. Okay, this is a great report. If you haven't read it, this was done by the uh, International Energy Agency on Paris. It uh, came out uh, two years ago. I can't remember, but it's good. this is a really solid report. It was the first one that really kind of tackled the issue of quantity of materials, quantity of minerals that are needed for uh, on a comparative basis. Now, since then, um, there's been a couple other reports, Wood McKenzie, for example, uh, that, that's come out with some, um, and then, well, we'll get into the benchmark mineral sheet. So, yeah, it was May 2021. 20, uh, okay. um, thing to keep in mind, we talk about critical minerals. It's just not for the green energy transition. 
We have to keep that in mind. A lot of people focus on how much we're going to need to effect to accomplish the green energy transition. But remember, there's lots of other stuff too. Stuff that's ongoing, stuff that's new technology-wise, stuff that's that's new or, or advances the standard limit. We've got to think about those too. But the green energy transmission, there's the consumption side, okay? That's electric vehicles, that's home heating stoves, et cetera. Um, it's the generation of electricity. It's the transmission electricity. It's the storage electricity. And on the green energy category, it also involves critical minerals that we need to advance other green energy technologies, for instance, hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, and that take, they, these are going to take a, a suite of stuff we don't usually uh, mine, in addition to stuff that we've mined on for a long time. Uh, we've got Critical minerals of military defense, our national security, our, tele, our tele, uh, telecommunications, what goes into our cell phones, goes into our big screen TVs, data centers. We kind of forget about the scale of the data centers in, to, in today's world and how much electricity they take. I think that I've heard data centers are 5% of total electrical generation in the United States, that's huge. Um, local regional infrastructure, industrial minerals, base metals, uh, they're not going to go away. Cement, agriculture, all those things that we still need. Really, this is our modern standard of living as we know it today, and hopefully how we're going to improve it, especially in undeveloped countries over the next, you know, 50, 60 uh, uh, decades. Now, this is the USGS list of critical minerals. I'm uh, not going to do much other than just say I kind of highlighted battery elements, magnet elements. Um, battery elements, that's what you need to go into the battery. Magnet elements, that's what goes into the propulsion system, the motors uh, on these uh, BEVs. So I got to have a place to store the power, and then I got a place to use the power. And they take a, a slightly different uh, uh, what volume application. And here's where I start to get a little concerned about what the future may look like on this. Not concerned, just kind of, wow, oh, that's interesting, puzzle, I guess. Um, supposing Elon Musk says, ah, I can get rid of neodymium and praseodymium and terbium and dysprosium in my electric motors. How are you going to do that? I don't know, but actually, I see uh, a press release or someone is quoted on that. And that gets back to my confusion. How much of this stuff can we actually think of as even semi credible? credible? I, don't, I don't know. There's just so much. Uh, so that's on magnets, battery elements. What's the big thing now? We got lithium, we got cobalt, we got nickel. All have to go into pieces, parts of the battery. What well, do we need? Lithium, ion batteries. Hmm. Are there other technologies? Oh yeah, there are. Are there other technologies being developed right now that could greatly de decrease the demand for lithium? You bet. People are working overtime to do that because they see the issue of cost. And that's the driver. If lithium is going to be at these kind of prices, we got to figure out a substitute. And not everything can be substituted. And so a lot of this stuff is really hard to find a substitute that works just as good. And it's at lower cost. But that doesn't keep people from crying. Enough people are crying. Yeah, all those things that come over the transom on press releases, and this is a new development, here's where we're going, you can pretty much bet. On a probability basis, a couple of those are probably going to come through. And that could have big changes. Right now, we're all focused on a lithium battery future. And I'm starting to get real. I'm starting to really question 
is that is how it's all going to evolve over the next 10 years. For a lot of reasons, obviously, the amount of lithium that's can, that would be needed, be demanded to produce half the vehicle fleet, uh, you know, basically. And on lithium, uh, the whole battery electric vehicles, and I was going to talk about this later, but I'll, I'll mention it now. I got to watch the clock so I don't uh, <laughs> get too. Um, I think that the electrical vehicle market, which is absolutely going dangerous, so Tulsi, tell, Tesla can't turn them out fast enough, but everybody, waiting lists are really. I think we may be hitting within the next two years a hiatus. I think market penetration may start to slow, particularly with the lithium ion battery technology. Why? Well, you, you've got the first, you know what an early adapter is? You've heard about these. Well, I think we may be approaching the end of the early adapter population. The ones that want to do it because this is new and, and fancy, we may be starting to get to there. Not that it's cold go away, but kind of fall off. Secondly, range. What, did, what range can you get on these two? Um, I drive back and forth up to South Dakota a lot. Man, I just can't imagine being out there around Lusk uh, when my battery uh, gets exhausted in a typical a typical weather day in, in uh, Wyoming. <laughs> okay. um, I was just back from Florida my, visiting my sister-in-law. And uh, yeah, been through several mass evacuations because of hurricanes. And I can't have trouble imagining two million battery electric vehicles on Interstate 75 trying to go north and having to sit in traffic and running out of charge. Uh, okay, other things, recharge time, uh, recharge availability. Uh, uh, battery light. Most people who buy battery electrics, uh, particularly lithium, they don't even think about this, but you're going to have to replace that battery at some time. It's not a partial replacement, it's the whole thing. And that's probably going to cost about a quarter of the original uh, uh, price of the automobile. Car insurance. Well, if you have an accident, with your internal combustion automobile, you take it down to the shop and you get it fixed. And they can, you know, well, we can fix this, we can bend it up. You get an accident with the, that affects the battery pack on these things, it's a full replacement of the battery pack. So I would think the insurance companies are going to drive that out. Weight, uh, lithium mine batteries, a lot of weight in that. Uh, and, uh, Obviously, a lot of aspects of it. And the fire hazard. If it's made, batteries made with materials that aren't quite right, you know, the mix of the cobalt that they, they become a fire hazard. My cousin, uh, my wife's cousin up here, uh, he was an early adapter and they had to get a uh, BW, I forget what it was, but a full electric car. And uh, so they ordered it, they had to wait a year. But it was coming. They put it on a boat out of Hamburg. A boat went down by the Canary Islands. And what happened? Boat caught fire and 4,500 uh, 4, electric vehicles went to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Well, he's back on the waiting list. So, you know, there are a lot of issues there. Maybe these could be solved or uh, mitigated in part by a different battery technology. One of these things that people are working on. So big shifts are kind of out there and could change the course of critical minerals, I think, pretty, pretty quickly. Okay, we have. 
All right. Um, observations on the critical mental supermination process. And some of these you should have picked up last week and listening to Jamie. If, when they do these critical mineral determinations, put out their list. 2018, they put one out. That was in response to executive orders. In 2017, they're doing it every three years. So they got another one that came out here uh, last February of last year. But there are single point determinations of snapshot. Uh, he had to put it really well. It's like you went to the doctor, your doctor, and the doctor gave you physical, and that's how you are right now. It's not like how you could be in three weeks. So um, it's kind of monitored. They're formula with historical data, often lag. Um, uh, they've got no predictive component in that. Yes, they do political assessments, political risk. Are you raising your hand, Bill? We lost your mic. Okay. What's that? Did we lose your mic? Yeah, I think it turned off. He does have a strong voice, so we didn't really. You didn't really, didn't really bother. Do you hear me, Bellary? Yeah. yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but the people online may not. Yeah. 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 Battery dead. Yeah. <laughs> Battery problems making it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's <laughs> 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 Oh, yes, it went off. I bet he did turn it off. <laughs> you like water? Oh, I got my cup back. Okay. So, okay. All right. I'll continue, Valerie. Um, <laughs> there's no predictive component. Some of the data employed. Even though it's the best available that they're using in making these determinations, you kind of heard that last week if you saw it. Um, it has holes or inaccuracies influence results. And I, I use copper as a, I mean, even though copper is not a critical material in the analysis, um, they get their data on imports, which is a big factor in determining well, uh, the critical, um, making the cr critical mineral list determination. Well, it turns out that uh, they're getting it from the Department of Commerce, which measures um, the import. They only report, only measure report imports up through semis. In other words, billets, pipes, um, stock. They're not measuring any of the copper that comes in in finished goods. Is that a fairly high number? <laughs> well, for some of these critical minerals, you bet it is. All these cars coming in, electrical goods, machine goods, refrigerators, TVs, not so much, but other appliances. So they're missing, in my mind, they're missing a component that if you really want to assess how critical uh, The battery died. Um, uh, so anyway, that, that's missing information on, or maybe not quite accurate information. Um, and then something I think my this media, governmental, everybody's obsession with critical minerals is really a relatively new phenomenon. Critical minerals only go about uh, these are critical minerals, and we have to worry about. Them. Really, it's only about five years. Well, and that's overseas and it's here. Were people concerned about it uh, before? 80 people? Yeah. Well, small number in the mining business. Uh, in fact, we could go back to, um, you know, the first looks at it was when the uh, Bureau of Mines was formed. And what was that? In the mid 30s or so? Earlier. Or earlier. Uh, they looked at something critical, particularly when uh, World War II came along. And then there were some studies done in the BOM and, and by some other outside agencies on uh, strategic minerals as part of the Cold War, prepper, uh, you know, keeping up with defense in the 1950s. But we didn't really pay much attention, anybody, uh, during the 70s, um, in the uh, 80s, when the 90s, started to see a lot of increase in the need for rare earths as uh, for technology and strategic defense purposes. And that's when there started to be some action uh, to assess how vulnerable we are to, to those. 
Uh, you have to remember, as part of the 50s, we had the creation of defense stockpiles. Okay? What happened at the end of the Cold War, 1989? Hey, we don't need those stockpiles anymore. Let's get rid of them. Uh, by the end of the 90s, we're starting to get a few people in the defense department starting to get worried about critical minerals or uh, uh, rare earths. I've been involved in it from the early 90s, uh, just you know, kind of on the periphery, uh, looking at it occasionally, looking at a, at a project and that type of stuff. But it really didn't get things get ranked up on critical minerals until the early 2000s. And at that time, it was really just focused on uh, rare earths. So we've gone through about, you know, up to up through the 2011, uh, little focus on uh, uh, critical rare earths, uh, which however we're going to get them, starting to realize that the Chinese had taken over all of our rare earths processing and fabrication of um, uh, magnet technology. We had let it all go out of the United States. There were a few lone voices in the wilderness trying to point this out and nobody paid attention uh, uh, to them. Then we had that little incident with the Chinese and the Japanese and the fishing boat, uh, where they were gonna cut off, Chinese were gonna cut off the uh, rare earth provision to Japan. And that caused prices of rare earths to go skyrocket and suddenly everybody's attention uh, got uh, slapped up on rare earths, nothing else yet. But it caused things to start to think about Jesus. And rare earths is a problem. We got any others that could be a, a problem as well. Where it really got its impetus when Elon Musk demonstrated to the world that he could make electric automobiles, which needed all this stuff. And when that, that, that was a fact, the fact he demonstrated that this is feasible, that's when uh, I think people really got uh, going on. But again, this, well, all you hear, we got a conference, Who's, who doesn't have a conference on critical things? <laughs> I don't know a single university that doesn't. I've got a list of about five, uh, five or six of them coming up in the next six months. Um, uh, the media, I mean, that's, I mean, the New York Times is talking about minerals. That's, that's an evil word uh, for the New York Times. So, you know, not everybody's got this book. Oh, after that. All right, I'm going to skip that. We don't need to talk about that. Um, we need a lot of them. It's only been the last year that, from what I've seen, we've actually seen the public uh, space estimates of what the amount of critical materials we might need. Here's our goal. How much do we need to, uh, to achieve? Now, I think other consultants have been doing that before now. But they're they're looking for a hundred grand for the multi climb study. Uh, this stuff is not available out there. But it started, and just in the last gosh, in just the last couple of months, I've seen stuff uh, information that Wood McKenzie's put out. Uh, Benchmark Materials continues to keep uh, putting it out. Um, you probably probably have seen these uh, these graphics. How many have seen them? Just uh, yeah, this came out last fall. Uh, and it caused quite a stir in the lay press, you know, the non mining press about, oh my gosh, there's those that many mines? Oh dear. We were thinking more in order of zero mines, but this is what it's going to take. Um, now, this study, which I like their methodology, they took here's what we have now as far as consumption of lithium or production of lithium. That's what we're going to need by 2035. Ooh, man, that's a factor of seven. And that's just a few years down the road. Uh, to get the number of mines, they took well, what would be sort of an average size lithium production facility. Well, that's probably as good as anything. Just divide it into the number of mines. 
Um, nickel, yeah. I'm, I have spent time in nickel. There's a sex spot, right? For you know the, the typical mineral or a nickel mine around the world. Um, so it, methodology, yes. For that time, two a year or two years ago, about as good as you, you can do. Uh, so they've done that for graphite and uh, uh, cobalt. How much raw material do you need just to run one of these massive battery plants? Lithium ion battery production facilities. Well, it said to run this thing for a year. Uh, again, this is Benchmark. And by the way, Benchmark started about, it's a consulting advisory uh, firm. They started, came into existence about 2015, 16. Um, I got curious about these, this number up there, the 2035 demand. Where'd that come from? Came from magic, fell out of the air. How'd you come up with it? So I actually called them up and talked to the people about this. They thought I was, oh my gosh, here we got a hot new client that's going to retain us for many thousands of dollars. Uh, they didn't realize just another old retired guy is kind of curious. But they talked about their organization around the world, of their experts, their analysts in China, in Europe, uh, in, in the Southeast Asia, and how their team compiled these numbers. And I got kind of reassured. And now that over the last but six months, I've seen more and more stuff that uh, was on. And guess what? They have critical minerals conferences. <laughs> One every month, someplace in the world. Um, okay, so this is their estimate. How much is it going to have to do? Lithium. You're going to need to have, to run this plant for a year, 100,000 to 115,000 metric tons of lithium, which today would represent 18% of global production. And how many battery plants are we gonna have around the world? Well, they're all over. And this is uh, from 2022, about how much gigawatt hour production capacity we're gonna have this now, uh, which is 44 uh, gigawatt hour capacity. It's actually about five times that now with all the announcements that the automobile manufacturers have made just, just in the last six months. But the big one is China. That's where the bulk of the battery production currently exists. Um, I think it'll continue to, to be the leader. All right, now... <clears throat> Wonder about going into this. Um, what I wanted to show is this 1960, 2021. This is copper production, not the critical minerals. So, what we have here, red line, is global primary production. The black line is consumed. How much consumed? What's the um, uh, green line? I got it right. Is world refined production. Well, that's just adding a recycle to it. So the distance between the red line and the green line is recycled copper. You notice that since 1960, this actually goes back to 1950, it keeps going up, right? And production keeps going up. That's because we made in the 1970s, we found some really big mines mostly in South America, that enabled the demand, the supply to keep up. And of course, the situation same in the United States, right? The purple line represents what is estimated, officially estimated to be, USGS estimated uh, uh, consumption of cotton in the United States, okay? This orange line is production. Even I can see that this is kind of a problem. Um, so, to keep this in mind, well, right now, global production is about 21 million tons 
of um, uh, finished copper or what turns into uh, finished copper. We look at it on a per capita basis on tons. So refined copper consumption in metric tons of uh, metric ton or a thousand metric tons over millions or actually millions, that's five million. That is on this axis, and we put it on a per capita basis over that. Now, in then right now, it's going to be a lot about intensity of use and how that changes as a nation's economy develops. As it becomes more developed like the U.S., our per capita consumption of base metals such as copper, lead, say that supposedly goes down. But I have two problems with that. One, if you have a technological development or policy change, such as we have with electrification of the country, the consumption per capita in the United States is going to go through the roof, right? Transmission lines, battery charging stations, all of this stuff. Um, the second thing is, I'm concerned about the whole kind of the whole globe. Okay, so I don't even really concern you know, all everybody's consumption and how uh, that's affected. Because I only have two drivers for consumption. My world's real simple. Population growth and intensity use. If the intensity use stalled out, we still have population growth. So uh, it's so let's look into the future and see what we can define on uh, production. Um, so here's our global uh, consumption, and I got three lines out here. Remember, we're about, uh, was it, seven kilograms per person uh, is a, a mobile per cap per capita. What happens if we just continued that and just looked at population? All right, so we would be up here at 30, what, 33, 30, something like that, million tons by 2050. What happens if we just looked at the trend on this? Because this really um, reflects combination of intensity use and uh, population growth. Well, that'd be a little bit more. But what if we do all these things that are on that list of climate control, climate mitigation, uh, conversion to green energy, et cetera, meet all those demands for uh, you know, the minerals that we need to meet that? Well, you can see these stars up here. Can you see those? Like that show. Mm -hmm. Where do those come from? Yeah, those I got from S and Global Market Intelligence. That was last summer. Really good report by S and P. The group that did this was actually a company done by experts in a company that S and P acquired. It was called IHS Market. Anybody heard of that? They were headquartered over here at the south end of the runway in Centennial. Okay. Who's the chair? Ed, I don't know if you'll recognize that. The chair of IHS market was a guy named, is a guy named Daniel Garrett. He's the grand guru of the world uh, hydrocarbon business. I mean, he is the, the top guy. And he is, still runs this division within. So the report you can get, um, it's actually available. Uh, and I went through that and I was really impressed. They did a fantastic job of building up demand under those regulations. What's it gonna take? And they took every component and they just said, okay, wind banks, how much do we need of this and that? And well, this was focused on copper. Uh, and each technology, each industrial sector, they added back the existing demand without all the new windmills and, and, and stuff. And so they really put together what I thought was this is a pretty, given all the uncertainties of it, this is a great study. These were the numbers that they came up with as far as how much copper we're going to do. So we got up there, uh, 2035, gosh, we're going to need something right around 40 million total tons of copper. 
And right now we're about 25 million tons. So we got to get another 15 million tons of copper. Well, okay, about 20% of that, because that's about what the ratio could come from recycling. So, okay, so 15 comes down to 12. 2035, remember, that's just around the quarter. So we got 12 million tons a year of new copper production. What's the average size of, uh, how many mines is that going to be? Well, there's lots of copper mines in the world, but the bulk of production comes from maybe 25 of the monsters. Let's take the biggest copper mine in the United States, Forensic. Half a million tons, or um, 500,000 tons of copper production a year. We need 12. We need, that means that we're going to have to have 24 Marenzis discovered and put in production somewhere in the world by 2035. That's 12 years. How long does it take to find a Greenfields copper mine? Well, you know, anywhere from five to 50 years. How long does it take to permit and build a copper mine? Depends where you are. Under the best, it depends where you are, but even the best conditions, talking five years. Um, resolution. And then we got resolution, yeah. no, here in the US, resolution, we're going on 20. And uh, yeah, so this is in my mind. No, and, and am I missing something? It's <laughs> obvious to me. I mean, it's simple math. But other people seem to be, well, this is my other theory on this. There are a lot of folks, and this is apologies to the younger people in here. There are a lot of folks that grew up with Harry Potter, right? <laughs> All read Harry Potter. And a lot of those people are now in policy making <laughs> positions in academia. And how do things get accomplished in Harry Potter? That magic. Don't have to think about it, right? Well, I mean, I can't, sometimes I can't come up with any other information. Okay, so that kind of illustrates the fact. This was another thing that's kind of interesting. How much copper has been produced up to this point in time in the whole world? It's this cube, 700 billion tons. How much are we going to need? 1.4 billion tons by 2050 in order to make the net zero. I, I, will, I kind of believe this number. Why? Because the bulk of this was measured. The bulk of this was produced since about 1870, and the records aren't that bad. So this odd number, I mean, how much was produced before 1700 top? And maybe just a little bit down here, back to 10,000 years. Over here, I think this is too much because I think this is represents both primary and secondary top. So you got the refine or that re recycled right here. But I could easily believe about 1 billion tons just by integrating that curve that you saw in the uh, S&P, right? That's a hell of a lot of copper. Okay, now S and B came up with a uh, prescription of how we're going to do this. How we're going to accomplish all that fifty billion tons of copper? Well, we can explore for and develop new primary primary production. Obviously, we got issues with that. Big and easy surface deposits have been found. We're going to have to attend more and more underground exploration, and that's a tough thing to do. The greenfield expiration takes a long time. Permitting capital requirements, but we sometimes forget a new Marinci would probably take, I don't know, six billion, seven billion dollars uh, to build. And what are the capital markets willing to finance in the minerals industry anymore? Basically, zip. They don't like mining. Private equity has had to take over uh, a lot of mine financing because the banks don't want to lend to mineral development. It's icky. Expand capacity existing mines. And this is, uh, this to me was, this is S&P, brightest guys. These guys are like the McKinsey uh, equivalent. 
And they said, we should be able to expand the capacity of mines. Well, yeah, but all the capacity expansion of existing mines going to do is try and keep you even because the grades are declining. You're going into lower grade ores. And since these are all over the pit, and a lot of them are very interesting topographical conditions or situation in South America, to expand the mine, you've got to move a lot more rock. You know, the laybacks and everything. So at best, past the exams, it's just going to keep me even. And recycling, recycling will continue to make inroads in the provision of copper and other uh, critical minerals. But it's going to take a long, long time to get there because we don't have the reservoir of recyclable materials. For aluminum, that reservoir has become, you know, not anywhere near 100%, but, you know, 40, 50%. So you've got to have a lot more copper scrap or obsolescence in copper components in whatever the product is before it really starts to make a contribution. 18, 20%, yeah, that problems. Okay, um, there's separation issues in metal. Uh, uh, steel, not so much, but I need a lot of the others. And so it's going to be decades before, you know, decades, 100 years before recycling is going to be, uh, have significant leverage on um, uh, reducing the need for primary production. Um, uh, okay. Um, these are a lot of, you can see what's on top there. Um, uh, I think we can go through that. I'm going to go on to the next one because I want to get to, okay. Now you have some observations. I'm sorry, Elon Musk, but the fundamental cause of the climate change is population, okay? If we only had 3 billion people in the world today, we might not have quite the uh, the climate change crisis that we have today. And by the way, I'm a believer in climate change. I started believing that in 1963 when I was 15 years old. How did I come there? I came off a farm. We went up to see my uncle in Minneapolis. We got him to 494 around by South Beltway. I saw those cars. And I said, Dave, this is going to be a problem. There's, there's so many cars and there's so much crap coming out of the tailpipe that it's got to go someplace, right? So I actually believe this, but this is a problem that we're running faster and faster on the treadmill. World population, 1950, 2.5 billion, now 8 billion, 2050, again, 27 years from now, 10 billion people. It is not 10 million people, it's 10 billion people. A bunch of them need to have economic development and be brought into a higher standard of living, which takes energy and it takes materials. U.S. population, 1950, I was three years old, there were 152 million people in the country. Today, we're over 330 million. That's more than a double. And then we're going to have 450 in subtraction projection by 2050. I'll be gone by then, so somebody can have my place. But, you know, um, so my conclusion is critical mineral supply will not meet the time, can anywhere near meeting time requirements for achieving the green energy transition as demanded in those earlier slides. This is what we need to accomplish. Critical mineral prices will significantly increase green energy to cost the green energy transition just because of you know, the shortage of it. This vast disconnect between policymakers, environmental experts, media, et cetera, and critical mineral supply reality will continue. Hey, we've had 10 years. You ain't gotten smart by now. Uh, I have questions whether you're going to get there. And this is the saddest one. Um, as I've written on this uh, several times, the U.S. government will continue to have no formal policy. The de facto U.S. supply strategy for critical minerals will be other countries. I don't see 
in the United States, mitigation or getting around or improvements, even if we did a accelerated permitting process, you're still going to have environmental advocates fight it in court and drag it out as long as it's again. I don't see how that could be reduced because you're starting to deal with fundamental rights, constitutional rights in the United States uh, to file a lawsuit, to be, to be heard. I don't see that. Um, so I, I think that's going to continue. Now I got one last slide, I think. Um, Transition is going to take much longer than advocates demand. Fossil fuels never go away. To me, the only solution to the climate change with all the factors that are involved here is nuclear. Uh, I was in the nuclear business. That's one of the first area I was in, in exploration uh, with it. I was uh, a country manager for uranium, for Anaconda, when Three Mile Isle ha happened. And the executives from ARCO came over and said, we're shutting down uranium. And I said, okay, guys, but it will be back. It may take decades, but it will, nuclear power will be back. And I think that that's eventually that that's where it is. Uh, deletion, uh, and then, again, I, can, I don't care anymore. I'm old. I'm, I'm riding off in the sunset. What do you mean? Green energy transition advocates really want anything. Opponents worry that once you have geoengineering, people won't make any sacrifice of cut emissions. They want the sword of Damocles hanging over humanity as annoyance to force us to follow their ideology. The climate change is more or less down to take the following form. I don't like aspects of our society. I don't like technology. I don't like capitalism. And this is nature's retribution. So we have to change the way we live. Are we going to change the way we live? No. Are folks in Africa going to give up aspirations to live the way we live? No. Is it ethically or morally right to, to disallow them to try to change, to, to attain a higher standard of living? Absolutely. Where did this come from? Nathan Marivold, February 2023. You know, nobody knows this guy. He was Bill Gates' chief technology officer for 13 years. He is a smart guy. All right, what last? Thing? All right, these are implications for mining, engineering, and geoscientist students in her terrorist reports. <laughs> okay, first of all, my guys, don't believe everything you hear, see in the mighty press or the media press. We we're talking about critical minerals and all of these other things new processes, new technology, uh, new discoveries. Remember, guys, mining business about half of the project of stands, they're made. For financial purposes and stock manipulation plays there. So we got to look at discoveries of that nature. More big changes in the climate goals and the solutions are coming. Even though we're on this path to create a battery driven, uh, renewable generation uh, society, uh, things are going to change. Population expands and everything else that goes along with that means that mineral demand will be ever expanding going to be high for decades to come across all sectors. People get hung up. I think if you're a student, say, oh, gosh, i got to get into critical minerals. But no, you don't. All those other metals, the non-critical, they're going to be growing just straight. Copper, yeah, but also iron ore and phosphates and sand and gravel and aggregates and just down the lines. Population's growing, standard living's growing. You're going to need more and more of those metals. So it's kind of uncertain which, which horse to bet on in the critical minerals race, but don't worry about it. the skill sets you have as a mining engineer or geoscientist, you can move those across in different things. 
New exploration development direction process techniques and professional talent are mandatory. Well, there's some big factors that are driving that. Autonomous mining, more underground exploration and, and mining, because that's where there are new big deposits and there's a new Marinci out there. It's going to have to look a lot like resolution. And it's going to be underground. And there's a lot of work to be done on new exploration tools if it goes out. And there will be a lot of mining engineering work to be able to make these things produce. Getting 500,000 tons a year copper production through a shaft that goes down 5,000 feet is a bit challenging. Um, End user participation in upstream mineral business requires knowledgeable professionals. If this trend continues, where you see the Elon Musk, the GMs, the Samsungs, all of them going into the upstream of mining to in order to secure supply. Remember, they got MBAs from the East Coast. They don't have mining engineers. You think they should have mining engineers to make help them make some of these decisions on who to invest in? Or are we getting screwed on this? You know, things like that. Uh, yeah, I think so. And then last point. I don't know if this is true, but we've got a bill going through Congress right now uh, about mining engineering schools or mineral schools and the support. One of the facts that I'm kind of involved in assembly data. One of the things we got thrown around was this. One Chinese university, the mining department at a single Chinese university has more mining students than all the schools in the United States put together. Well, they imply that, geez, the whole mining community, the mining industry and gold mining is going to be run by Chinese engineers. That's not going to happen. Western world cannot, will not rely. Chinese engineers are totally existing professional game. And it looks our relationship with the chairman change real pretty dramatically. Okay, that's all I've got. I'm sorry I ran over uh, on this and I said I had too much crap to uh, put out on this. Do you want to take some questions? Great, dude. I give uh, the a PDF of the slides if anybody wants to have them. Just Thank get you. Just kidding. Yeah, David. Oh, no, I was going to say thanks. I appreciate that. Some of the graphs, I wasn't able to read that well, but it seemed you have very interesting information. So, <laughs> so getting the PDF would be great because then I can zoom in on those. Yeah, you can go in and look and look at that. Yeah, yeah this, this is this difficult. That's why. Yeah, they're all on the PDF. Okay. So, yeah. Hey, Dave, this was great. You're really good. Um, you, Mike Kendrick from uh, Climax or Freeport a couple of years ago gave a talk on copper and he's showing declining uh, ore grains, ore grains. Yeah. out of their his existing assets. And what he did was he looked at broke up production in North America in copper by the age of the properties. It's pretty horrifying because there's an exponential curve to that. It is an almost exponential. When I got into copper business with Anaconda 40 years ago, uh, four tenths of percent copper. That was the cutoff. <laughs> if you didn't have 1.2, 1.4, it was kind of like, why bother? Yeah. And today, four tenths, that's high grade. That's <laughs> The other thing I thought was interesting, I don't know, it was a Wall Street Journal article a while back, and it was talking about um, the highway taxes that are being paid by fuel, you know, when you buy gasoline. By going to EVs, what's going to happen is effectively the, the overall tax rate per gallon has got to double or triple. or triple, and that's going to be another incentive for, you know, government's very, very aware of that, but they're going to use that for incentive. To try to put another, another incentive, yeah. incentive to push people like that. 
just like they did with increasing the, uh, what was it, the lower the emissions, tailpipe yeah. emissions, um, uh, which just uh, last week. Cleaner Act. Yeah. Uh, and so train coming together either, uh, I don't think they'll be successful in, in driving out internal combustion engines to the degree um, that they expect. I know my 2019 Honda Passport will last me all the way to the home. <laughs> and after that, fine, but I'm not having the record. Like I said, I'm not going across Wyoming in winter. <laughs> my battery electric. Pulling in the lust in the middle of the snowstorm and said, Hey, where's your charging station, Mr. Cowboy? <laughs> well, that, that's where it becomes regional. Because if yeah. we were if we were in Western Europe, so oh. many people would say, hey, this is great because I never drive more than 100 kilos. It's the same thing. An uh, urban area. If I was in southern Los Angeles, if you're in New York or a place like that, makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. I, I've thought the one thing that you should have done on this slide for the top line is you should have quoted Mark Twain because he basically wrote the same thing in roughing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, but the other thing you didn't mention, you talked about mining, but the other issue is and, and the other thing that seems to get lost in the chaos is processing, which is needed whether we recycle or private. Yes, yes. And uh, you guys talk about what time it takes to, I'm on the processing side for a mine, try to get a, this, a processing plant permitted. Now, in many, most you know, communities, uh, you will find the same thing. Someone will go, Oh, it has emissions, you know, so then it drags the process out months and years. And yeah, that's a, it's, it's another issue that needs to be considered. And that's the one thing that I think a lot of the government policy people have missed is the downstream processing. They, they forget that part. They of the forget right. that part. Actually, we make progress in that just in the last few years on, on the rare earths. Up until Remember when I gave a talk down in, in Tucson, and the big thing was, it's not the resource for rare earths, it's the processing. That was completely ignored by DOE and uh, uh, the DOD, but now they realize that. I don't really, collectively, all of us have been screaming about focus on the process, processing for rare earths, it finally sunk through. And that's where the money like goes. We've got a question from online. Okay, we've got one question and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Ah, oh, it's going to be. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. okay. Is that edging? Oh, oh that's part of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just, well, thank you, Dave. Thank, really thank you. Thank you for putting up with me. All right. Good stuff. That was great. Hey, Okay, well, we'll take you know. I think it's yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm trying to kill